oh, maybe it's a you problem. I feel like I want to say this to people sometimes because <laughs> you can switch companies all you want, but you can't get rid of yourself. You're still running a business of one. I cannot imagine life without them. Right? <laughs> like they know you. Your sphere, the people you know, probably don't even realize where you are. Guess what? I am now with ABC Realty. Let me tell you why. Now they're like my best friends. Right? You're like, I'm so <laughs> glad I'm here. Hi, y'all. Welcome to Hustle Humbly. It's Alyssa and Katie, and we are two top producing realtors in the Baton Rouge market. We work for two different companies where we should be competitors, but we have chosen community over competition. The goal of our podcast is to encourage you to find your own way in business. So stop comparing yourself and start embracing your strengths. Hi, Alyssa. Hey, Katie. Welcome. It's episode 194, and today we're going to be choosing a broker. Wonderful. What an exciting time. We got a late start to recording today because we were sifting through some questions some that have been coming common in. Common questions. And we were trying to organize our thoughts into... <laughs> Admittedly, my thoughts were not very organized. <laughs> into what episodes should go where. Right. So you're in for a special treat the next four weeks. Because you're going to give them a little preview. I am. Okay. So we decided based on your questions that we would start today with how to choose a broker. Okay. Maybe um, you are looking to switch. We do have an episode on how to switch brokerages. That is also. episode 56. Okay, great. 56. How Should you change brokers? Yes. Yeah, so you could also listen to that one, but this one could also be helpful. Okay. And then the second next week will be, how did we word it? If we had to do it all over again. If we had to do it all over again. Like if we restarted our business. What would we do differently? From zero. Yes. What would you do? Mm -hmm. Or maybe the same. Just what would you do? Sure. Okay. And then the next episode will be about why we are solo. It, our, just solo our solo journey. Our journey. It's going to be just a story about our journey. Yes. Why we're solo. How we came to be. Yeah. Things right? we have explored that maybe didn't work out. Correct. And then we will end with... Part-time versus full-time, mm -hmm. side hustle. Yep. Like, what if you're working as a realtor, but you need money now? Yeah. What are some real estate-specific side hustles? Right. Stay tuned. That you won't lose sight of the fact that you are a realtor. Correct. Um, and you will – we have thoughts, and you will have to wait until then. We have thoughts and examples. Just stay tuned. Yes. Okay. So now everyone knows what's coming. Yeah. Coming soon. Yeah. Um, Again, episode 56 is the should you change brokers. And I do think that episode was very much rooted in mindset and talking about what is making you want to change brokers. And then here are the questions to ask yourself and what do you need to do to decide if that's really the answer to to improving your business. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. The other one that you might want to go back to is episode 26, mm -hmm. which is everything we wished we knew before starting. We do touch on interviewing brokerages yeah. in that episode as well, if yeah. you need some more insight. Yeah. And you've told us the story a couple of times now about realizing that you do the interviewing. Correct. So we're going to get there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Alyssa, where should we start? Oh, oh I'd like to start with something. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, great. Um, a number one, you interviewed two Brokers, right? Three. Okay, three brokers and chose one and have always been there for your whole 11 years, My right? My whole career, yes. Okay, so your frame of reference on this is good, it's fine, but you didn't move around a lot. I, Never. No, right. <laughs> I interviewed two brokers in the beginning. I selected one. I quickly learned within three months that that was not a fit for me. Okay. I went to another small, like boutique, tiny, tiny brokerage with like five agents after that um, because I was about to quit. Mm -hmm. So it was like, I got to make a change. Do I quit? I haven't sold anything. Is this the career for me? Three months in? I don't know. I switched brokers. That was a great decision. Um, and then that brokerage actually closed or I guess we'll say merged or was acquired okay ish by a remax locally that was already open so then i ended up at remax but i did not interview you know it was more sure, like i was staying happened. with my current broker 
almost in a pseudo team vibe because she was my broker and I was going with her, but I didn't work under her right. as a team member. Okay. Then in 2020, I moved for the last time. So that's correct. Four brokers in 17 years. Okay. Um, and that move was, maybe we'll get into it a bit later, was facilitated by just making some changes in how I wanted to run my business, like what I wanted to affiliate with, how I wanted to change my business expenses. Yeah. Because, you know, working at a big franchise can be costly. Sure. Okay. Now you can start. Oh. Now go. Now go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, yeah. I feel like whenever I started, I, do you want me to tell the story again? I think you should. Okay. When I first started real estate, I interviewed three brokerages. I was just getting out of grad school, and so I was coming from more of a corporate mindset. Mm -hmm. So job interviews were very present in my life at that time. You were prepared to be interviewed. Yes. Yeah. And my dad, who is a real estate appraiser, told me that they all want to hire you you're not really going to be interviewed as much as you are going to interview them. Right. And I thought, okay, that's good to know. I really had to shift my mindset. So he said, you know, with with real estate, there is no salary. <laughs> You're like, oh. You do not get paid. No. You have to make it happen for right. yourself. If you sell something, whoever you work under gets a piece of the pie. Right. So the more that they can have under them, the better they are. And if you sell nothing, it hurts them not. They don't care. They don't care because they're not paying you. Right. So that really helped me understand going into this. Right. So I had set up three interviews. And the first one that I went to um, was actually the opposite of what he had told me. It, <laughs> it was a Remax. And they were very kind. But they were... They, were, they helped me by saying, you know, we don't really in this office do new agents. Right. Because the people here have – they've been in the business. They're not here for training and support because they have their own systems in place. Yeah. They just want to hang their hat on the name. But, you know, and the underlying issue of that is because it is it is super lucrative and Remax is set up to accommodate – like a, a a producing agent, a veteran type agent, which I like that. But it is also expensive to be at a Remax if you are not a producing agent. That is why they do not recruit. Right. The structure is not really ideal for a brand new agent. And what's interesting is that that is similar to how my company is now. Not in the fact. So my company is very new agent friendly. Yeah. But they don't do a lot of recruiting. They don't want to hire everyone. Right. Um. They aren't looking for quantity over quality. They really like if, you know, at the end of each year, if you haven't sold a house at all, they they might be having a chat with you about, is this the best place for you? It's obviously not working for you. We right. want you to be successful. Maybe somewhere else would be a better fit. Yeah. So I appreciated that I was given the truth and um, I actually find them very similar to what how we are also on yeah. the experienced agent side. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then I went to company number two mm -hmm. and it was just very different, very exciting. Mm -hmm. Big numbers were discussed about what your potential income could be. The sky is the limit. Just all, you know, so exciting. Yep. Sign here. Sign here. And I really was like, You're like it's going to be so fun. Yeah, this is going to be great. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I still had one more interview, which was with my broker that I'm with now. Mm -hmm. And when I sat down with her, with Connie, who we have interviewed before, mm -hmm. she immediately jumped in. I mean, I'm sitting in her chair as a single 22-year-old. Right. So she's immediately jumping into, do you have savings? Can you support yourself financially? What is your plan? Right. And she, to this day, is very adamant about having a business plan, treating it like a business. And I thought, yes, th this is clicking with me. Right. I need to think of it this way. Yeah. I'm not here to have fun. 
I mean, it is, you know, but I'm here <laughs> as a figuring out what I'm going to do with my life as right. a career. Right. So I need to think about it as a business. Mm -hmm. What, how much money do I need to make? How many houses does it take to do that? And how do I get those clients? Right. So she was really the most realistic. Mm-hmm encouraging, but also like, this is what it's going to take. Right. And I think that that is what helped me be successful early. Yeah. Because anytime I had a disappointment happen mm -hmm. or a friend that didn't use me or a family member that thought I was too young and didn't use me, I remembered being like, she said this would happen. And it, and it is it happening. Is. Right. You know, like it, I was prepared for it. I mean, it's still Stings. Stings. Yeah. But um, I just felt like she set me up for what I needed to know so that when the hard times came, yeah. I was pr I knew that they were coming. I wasn't blindsided right. by how hard those first three years were. Do you think that you were a harder worker because she told you it took work? I, I do. I, I truly think that is the case. Like, yeah, she didn't say, come here, rah, rah, and it's going to be great. And you're going to make all this money. Easy peasy. She was like, this is hard. It's going to be work. And you it's not going to be immediate. Sure. OK. So I was like, OK, well, that's good to know. I was, you know, at that time still bartending, waiting tables and figuring out at what point I needed to let that go. And she was the one who was like, you need to figure out a number. Mm -hmm. And when you hit that number, you cut it off. Like she – I like that our company doesn't necessarily want you to be part-time. Right. It, like if you want to be part-time, there's plenty of other companies out there that would be fine with that. Right, right, right. So – she was like, it's fine if we need to do this, but you need to have an exit plan. Yeah. Like, we're not going to do this forever. If you want to be a realtor and actually make real money, then you're going to have to jump in yeah. at some point. And I was like, okay. 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 Right. And then we kind of had to get together with a plan on what that looks like. Okay. How did you prepare for that interview? I know it's been kind of a minute. Did you have a list of questions? I didn't have a list of questions. Um because they've done it over and over again. So they will guide the interview and tell you what they want you to know. Yes. But but that is why I think it's important to know um, what you – I didn't – I don't think I really knew what I needed to ask right. at that time. Okay. So okay, no. Okay, good news. We're going to share with the listeners what to ask. Okay, great. Should we, should we jump into that? Yeah, or let's, let's go there. Okay, let's do that. I also want to tell you that – as we were preparing, and I was picturing myself as a new agent, if I was starting again, like, what would I look for in a company? I mean, honestly, I think the size is important. Being a small fish in a giant pond is not a good fit for me because when you're low in confidence and you don't feel like you know what you're doing, you're not just going to roll into an office of 200 people and be like, yeah, I'm here. I'm happy to help. I'll do your termites inspections for you or I'll run and do some stagings or I'm I'm a no, I'm going to be like shrinking in a corner mm -hmm. feeling like so small because it, you have to remember too, some offices you show up into are not welcoming you with open arms. You're the competition. Mm, just because you mm. just because you work in the same office doesn't mean like they they want you to succeed. They they're like, "Oh, another new agent, you know, like just another right. person who could possibly cross over my sphere or get an online lead that I was trying to, you know, I actually would you believe I never thought about that? <laughs> I love that your <laughs> office is that type of place. But I think that the majority of agents would say they encounter some feelings of resentment or Even within the competitiveness. Office. Yes. Wow. 100%. Okay. So when you show up to the office to be interviewed, don't just pay attention to how the broker treats you, but maybe get a vibe off of the, you know, Who's answering the phone? Are there mm -hmm. some other agents in there? Are they like thrilled to see you? Or are they kind of like in their own space? Or do they look a little standoffish? I mean, like this is going to be important to if you can assimilate yourself into the group, right? Sure. And be successful. Mm -hmm. So personally. And I think just like anything, though, especially like, for example, the company I'm with is a large company, but it's broken up locally, you yeah. know, and then we do, we do big company events together. But the big thing for me was that 
at the time when I started, we had the Monday morning meeting. Yeah. And at the time, it was like six of us. Right. Who that's met fine. in a small room. It's very intimate. With our broker every morning, I mean, every Monday morning and went through everything. And now that group is about 20. Okay. But out of an office of hundreds, right. you know, so it's almost, again, you get out of it what you put into it. Oh, for sure. And, you know, our broker is very big on that, too. She'll help you no matter what. But did you attend the class that they offered? Mm-hmm. Are you making the most out of what they're offering you? Mm-hmm. And are you attending the meetings and anything that... Um, is at the office or trainings that they have, mm-hmm. are you attending? Right. And that also goes back into the episode when we talk about should you switch brokerages. Yeah. We talk about that. Yeah. We talk about before you switch, just make sure that you're utilizing everything that right. is being offered mm-hmm. to you Yeah. so that you don't go where you think the grass is greener only to not use those resources either. Right. Maybe it's a you problem. Right. Right. Okay. Are you going to give me some questions? Oh, maybe it's a you problem. Gosh, I feel like I want to say this to people sometimes because <laughs> maybe like, it's the a company, you problem. The company to me – I'm going to go off a small tangent. Please. The let's. company to me is a 30% factor of importance. Okay. I agree. The rest, the 70% is you. A few years ago, um, when our office – so it it was a little confusing, but we changed names. There was no transfer of ownership. They were just trying to make us all uniform across the state. So that's when we changed names. And they gathered the top 30 agents to kind of have that conversation with us before making the change. Okay. And like anything, at first you're kind of like, oh, I don't know, change. Ah, I don't right. want to change anything. I'd have been like, take this brown. I'm I was. Happy to I go. was. Take it. Take it. Take it. Um, but at the end of the day, it was a very quick discussion. It was like five minutes of like grumblings and confusion and ah, change, I'm resisting. And then it quickly went to, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I have a client who I have sold nine houses to. And to prove a point, I texted them and said, hey, what company do I work for? They did not know. Right. Because they knew me. Right. They knew that they wanted to work with me. And they like how I treat my clients. And they like my systems and my processes. And that comes from me. Yeah. Choosing a brokerage will determine how you be, especially if if you're brand new, I think it's more important. Yeah. It's more important to start off on the right foot for sure. Mm -hmm. But if you have been in this and you think switching companies is going to fix everything, it is just not true. Right. The company that you work for is secondary to how you conduct yourself. Right. It goes back to that question. If you hired you Mm -hmm. to run your business, would you fire you? Right. You can switch companies all you want, but you can't get get rid of yourself. You're still running a business of one. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're still the business. And so I do think there is a lot of self-reflection that comes during this time. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. So when you're interviewing brokers, understanding how you get paid is important. Yes. It is a business decision. Yeah. You need to understand. Right. Okay. So some of the questions that you could ask on the financial end. Mm-hmm. What are your commission splits? Mm-hmm. 60 40, 70 30, 80 20. You know, there's splits, but then there's also fees. Right. So right. outside of your 80 20 split, mm-hmm. is there a transaction fee? Is there a desk fee? Mm-hmm. Is there a franchise fee? Right. Is there an admin fee? Is there a coaching fee? Right. Is there a tech fee? Right. Which ones are required? Right. Do I have to buy your CRM that your office uses? Right. Right. Um, Do I pay for my own signs and lock boxes? Right. There are so many things outside of the split that are Mm -hmm. important to understand. Right. What is being provided is the probably the primary. So. It's not always apples to apples, right? I think a lot of people are like, oh, this office is – it's the same as 
when um, clients are like, well, the interest rate here is lower at this lender than this one. And you're like, but the fees are way right, more. Like, right. So, tomato, tomato. Right. Like maybe the split is one way, but the fees are another. You you can't just say, oh, well, X company was this split and X company was this split. And obviously one is better than the other. Sure. Some companies have a cap, some pe- which means you only pay so much in in your split. And then the rest of the year, you get 100% of your commission. Mm-hmm. Some companies don't have a cap. Some maybe have like a flat fee for the whole year. Maybe they have, um, you know, a 60-40 split and you're getting just tons of things that you don't have to pay for, but that you would not, maybe they pay for your listing photos. Maybe they pay for your signs and your lock boxes. Maybe mm-hmm. they pay for you to have, you know, mailers to your database once a month. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Like you have to get all of the details of the financial part to be able to compare two companies. Sure. Y- there's no way you could just hear the split Mm-mm. and know, like, is there a transaction fee? So if I'm a higher producer, do mm-hmm. I have to then provide that fee more often? Mm-hmm. You know, if I'm only selling one house a year and the transaction fee is $200 a transaction, that's $200. If I'm selling 10 houses, it's $2,000. So with the co- you've been at a few. Yep. Have they been significantly different? Yeah, huge. Huge difference. Hugely different. Okay. In fact, um, and you cannot just also say, oh, Remax is this. Okay. No. Because Remax is a franchise, just like a Keller Williams is a franchise and a Cobalt Banker. There, that's why everyone says independently owned and operated. Mm. Every single office can have a different structure. Are there probably some parameters set in place by that ultimate company, like the biggest? Yeah, maybe so. Maybe you can't give a split better than 70 to 30. Maybe you can't give a split better than 80 20. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But every single Remax office is different. Sure. So even if their split was the same, their fees could be t- totally different. Maybe that office is in a nicer part of town. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a bigger office. Maybe they provide three admins. Maybe they do all the transaction coordinating. It's almost the same as interviewing at a bunch of different independent brokers Mm -hmm. because their offices are all run differently. Sure. So it was at my office when I was at Remax, there was a split for agents who didn't want to pay the large office fee. Yeah. Okay, so I had to give more of my money back or there was the very high like split to me where my desk fee or my office fee was bigger. But as a producing agent, it was a no brainer that I would pay the bigger monthly fee Mm -hmm. because I knew that when I got those commissions, I was getting the large majority of my money. Sure. And I knew that I was going to be producing. So why wouldn't I? And I had to pick a time to switch. I didn't start off that way. And I think that's a great point that you made is that you were at a point where your business was established. Yeah. So you knew your production. You knew kind of your average each year. And you knew an income to use. I really admire this one agent um, that I have met recently in our marketplace. She just switched companies. Um, But she really inner like kind of the second time around she knew now Mm -hmm. she's a brand new agent the first time yeah now she kind of knows what she what she needs for her business what she needs for herself so she really i was so proud of her did her due diligence and it was between these two companies Mm -hmm. and i will tell you she chose one that had a um higher or a lower split so she was actually not choosing the one that put the most cash in her pocket, Mm -hmm. but she really liked their education calendar and the training that they did and that they had stuff in the office. Like she knew Mm -hmm. for herself to be successful, she needs an office where people are in the office and she needs to attend things in person. Right. And that she knew she would make more there because of what they offered. Right. And I thought, gosh, it was so refreshing mm-hmm. to hear someone make a decision not just based on, you know, right. 80 20. But I will say, I think that it goes the exact opposite way sometimes, too. Yes. They're like, oh, well, I was promised all these fun things in the office and all of these classes and all of this community yep. and all of these whatevers. And I'm, I'm willing to give. of my commission up to the office because look at what they're providing. And Mm -hmm. then you get there and you don't use those things. You have to Then you're just giving away 50% of your commission for something that you're not utilizing. So that is a problem. And something else that I had made a note on for this is don't feel like you have to rush this decision. Right. 
after you interview, you do not have to make a decision. Ask if you can attend a sales meeting. Yeah. See how many people attend the sales meeting. Is the information valuable? Yeah. Do you feel like you would get something? I mean, you can't use all their resources and attend meetings for a month, but one meeting at Mm -hmm. the company will really introduce you to the culture, Mm -hmm. to their teaching style. Um, Ask to tour the office. You know, are there agents working in the office? How do the agents react to you when you take the tour? Yeah. Are they kind? Are they helpful? Um, Meet the staff that works in the office. Ask them what they do. Mm -hmm. Um, Ask them how long they've been with the company. Yeah. These are all questions that I think are very important now that I have been in it longer, I realize like my secretaries in my office are the same ones that have been there since I started. I mean, that's crazy. I cannot imagine life without them. Right. <laughs> like they know you. Yes. And they've seen me through all sorts of things, yeah. you know? Um, but yeah, it's okay to ask those questions. Ask if you can have phone numbers of three to five agents who work in the office. I've had many agents call me and say, hey, I interviewed with Connie and she said I could give you a call to just ask a few questions. Yeah. Sure. I would love to answer your questions, you know. Um, So I think you can tell a lot just from attending a meeting, meeting out. It's not just about the interview. Right. The interview, everyone is on their best behavior. Yeah. You really need to see what you're getting into. This is a big decision. I know. Uh, It's also a decision that can be undone. So I think that a lot of times we get into one and we're like, oh, no, this is not a fit. And this comes up in the in episode uh, 56. And then we're like, oh, I've already said I have to stay here. I'm going to be too embarrassed if I leave. What if I have to make a new post that says I'm at so and so broker? Well, it doesn't matter. You don't have to post it. And like we said before, your sphere, the people you know, probably don't even realize where you are. Uh, Well, so I always thought, too. And I don't know because I've never done it, so it may change. But I would be on the fence about if if something happened and I changed companies, I don't know that I would necessarily have a big announcement. I don't think post. I would. I don't think I would be like, guess what? I am now with ABC Realty. Right. Let me tell you right. why. Like nobody no. cares. They don't care. No, my clients don't care. No, it's not doing anything for them. No, it's it's about if they want to work with me or not. Right. Hey, Alyssa. Hey, Katie. What do we mention almost every episode? Email templates. You're right. We sure do. (laughs) And after every time we mention an email template, do you know what we get? Emails asking if they can have (laughs) copies of the email template. Can you send me a copy of that template? I have never had one like that. That sounds great. And you know what the good news is? What? You can get all of our email templates from our course, Email Templates 101. Tell the people about it. Our course has all of the email templates you would need to send to your buyers and your sellers and your clients that are buying and selling at the same time. Exactly. (laughs) To get through every step of the transaction and giving them information that they need for where they are in the transaction. It's great because you never forget to tell them something. Yes, and we've already done all the work for you. We wrote them and you can personalize them. Yes. And just feel organized knowing that you have all the information where it needs to be. And if you purchase Email Templates 101, you do get lifetime access. So occasionally we like to go in and make updates based on the market or if we find a new best practice. And we put that right into the template and you get that updated straight away. It just goes straight to your course. Yep. Right, it's, it's just there. It's, it's just already there. in there. It's just already there. in there. You don't even have to worry about it. We'll That's send wonderful. you an email and we'll say updated. That's great. Where can they find these email templates? You can find the email templates at email templates with an S 101.com. Email templates 101.com. Yes, head over for reviews and all of the specifics. Wonderful. Okay, enjoy. Um, I think that another question I would be real so we did what is the split what are the fees right this is our, this is yes. our question list and then a cap okay what is the cap what is the cap do you have a cap does it stop at some point and then ours too what I what I found the, so even though I've been with one company there has been two or three times where they tweaked things okay always for the better I the feel. structure yeah and sometimes it was like tomato tomato to me like you're like all right whatever whatever it kind of came out the same but they switched to where you start 
your split based on how you did last year. Okay. So the more you sold last year, Mm -hmm. if you sold really well, maybe you start at 85.15. Okay. um, And then you jump up. What if you have a bad year, then that year, does the split go like down again? Yes. You always. So every year it starts different. Yeah. But I mean, mine doesn't. Because you're consistent. I'm consistent. Right. Okay. And I think that is the culture that my office is trying to invite with right. this system. They want producing agents that are consistent and treat this as a business. I think that's the same thing with all Remaxes. Right. They're, same. They're, you're attracting a consistent agent because the way the pay is structured, it only makes sense for agents who are consistent. Correct. Okay. And so I thought that was interesting. Yeah. So, and I only share that example to say there are so many creative things. There are so many plans, commission plans out there Yeah. that – we would never be able to cover all the different scenarios. No, 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 no. And no, new companies are coming up all the time. Like these big, different, interesting, you know, they give you other things, right? Mm-hmm. They're going to give you a stock option or, a, you know, some sort of revenue share or some other stream of income. I mean, you have to take it all into account. Mm-hmm. Um, and ultimately, though, it's the money Plus the other things. What is the culture? What, like, what are the, it's not one thing, right? Like, we can't just pick one piece of a broker and be like, oh, well, I have to go here. When you talk to a broker, just make sure that are they getting paid if I. What's the intention? Is is their heart in the right place? Is your heart in the right place? It's fine. My next question would be for your broker that you're interviewing how many agents are in the office? Yeah. How many are there? And then I would ask, how many come to the meetings? Like, how many are participating on a regular basis? Because there may be 100 agents in the office with a core 20 that show up for everything, right? Right. So it almost feels like you're in an office of 20. And if you're looking for a midsize office, I think 20 is a great number. If you're worried that 100 agents are showing up to everything and you're not the most confident and you don't want to, like, stand up in the room full of 100 people and say this is what my buyer's looking for or whatever the process Mm -hmm. is, then you need a smaller office. But what if there's only 20 people who are coming? Sure. So I think that I would want to know that someone is showing up, but that maybe if there's 100, maybe I don't want to be somewhere where 100 people are showing up. Mm -hmm. Personally, me. But you want to ask how many agents are here and how many are going to come to, you know, events. Sure. Okay. What's your next question on your list? Um. If I have questions outside of business hours, is there like someone I could call if I need help with a contract on the weekend? Mm -hmm. What kind of support do I have as a new agent when I'm trying to figure something out? Right. Maybe they have a mentor program. Yeah. Or you follow someone in the office. Um, What types of classes do they have and how often? Are they online? Are they in person? Mm -hmm. Uh, So really figuring out like the education and the support aspect of it. Um, are there any meetings that are mandatory to attend? Sometimes I think that's kind of gone away, but yeah, like for example, we used to do office tour, mm-hmm. okay, where a- after sales meeting on Wednesdays, we would tour some of the new listings, mm-hmm. but to have your house on tour, you had to be a tourer on other weeks. Yeah. So it was kind of like, you know, we help each other out. Okay. Um, I would like to say something about education Okay. while we're on that. Um, I think it is also common in real estate that franchise, small offices, whoever, feel like providing education is one of the biggest items of value they can give in order to attract agents and retain agents. And it does get to a point where there can be too much education. There can be too many options. It can get too overwhelming once you're there. If there's a class every Tuesday and Thursday and an online program and a whole um, university of information, like this is a bit overwhelming as a new agent when you're trying to sort out what do I need to know, Mm -hmm. okay? So if you're new, new, like you're brand new, you need to also find a broker that's going to be like, this is the success path. Mm -hmm. These are the things you'll want to do. Like these are the classes you'll want to take. Yeah, sure. Occasionally we have something on an off topic that isn't like a primary focus of how you do your job. But here's the XYZ, the ABC, whatever, of you getting started. If your new broker can't tell you what the path is for you as a brand new agent to go through this 
you know, these steps, it's going to be very hard for you. Yeah. You can't just jump into the middle where people are learning about tactics for for sale by owners mm-hmm. or um, how to call expired listings or here's my very specific marketing plan for a listing. Like these are super in the weeds. What if you don't even know how to meet a buyer at an appointment and show them a house? Sure. What it, like what if you don't even know what you have to share with the seller as far as disclosures are when you go to list a property? Mm-hmm. Like you have to know the basics and it's all the stuff that they missed um, in real estate school. Yeah. But they sometimes also miss when you just jump in with everyone who may be further down the path at your new office. Mm-hmm. There's a there's a break there yeah. where it's like I need to know the basics of how to perform all of these tasks. So just make sure that you don't go somewhere that has – all the education, do they have the right education for where you're at in your career? Mm-hmm. Okay. That's my side note on education. I think it's good. Okay. Um, how, as far as who is in charge, the office manager, the broker, the go-to person at your office, how present are they? Like I had, to, I've been taken to arbitration before in which yeah. your broker is supposed to attend with you and basically right. act as your attorney of yeah. sorts in real estate court. Right. Um, I had never been so happy to, to be where I was in that time. Yeah. But I also know that I have, I've had issues before, like we had a issue with a contract and me and the other agent were working together on how to fix it. And I said, well, what does your broker think? And they were like, oh, I am i can't call my broker about this. I'm like, wow, I need what? to be able to call my broker right. or some managing person about contract issues. And I also feel like that is something you don't think about until you're in it. Yeah. And then you're like, wait, who do I ask about where this, what blank this goes on mm-hmm. or where, what I need to do for this mm-hmm. or how do I handle a specific situation? I'll get random emails from Connie being like, hey, I don't like how you word this when you write it in your contracts. Can you be sure to write it this way? Like, and oh. I'm like, you look at my contract. I'm sorry. <laughs> like she's reviewing things. That's like good. how on top of it, are, how involved are they in right. making sure that you're protected? Mm-hmm. Um. I thought, too, something I found interesting from someone that was also just looking at a new switching switching companies was how many new agents do they have right now? Because that kind of shows like um, how are there how many people have been there longer than 10 years? Yeah. What is the turnover? Like right. how I think knowing how long people have been at that company it's and what their track record telltale. is. Telltale. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. That was a big decision in mine. Yeah. You know, is that a lot of the people that have been there, there's not a lot of turnover here. Right. And they have been there for decades. Right. They're happy there. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, it, it's just good. Something to look at. Mm-hmm. Let's see. What else? Um, okay. Well, let's go back to – Meetings, uh, education, community opportunities. I would ask, how often are are things offered? What kind of things are they? Is it a you know group yoga class? Is it another class about you know flood insurance that I don't want to go to? Like, sure. what what are the things that you're doing? What are the events? How is community being built there? Because you 100 percent need the community. And when we go into our solo agent episode. We're going to touch on this more, but you cannot go to an office with five people who never meet. If you need some assistance, there's no one there, you know, Mm -hmm. like who's going to do, who's going to run and do a showing for you Mm -hmm. if you are sick. Right. I I don't know. Like, so I think you need to ask what is, what are the events? How often do, can I see people? And is there a brick and mortar office? Mm -hmm. Can I work here? Is there a co-working space? Do I have to pay for an office space? Like how many people are in here on a daily basis? Because in the beginning, showing up to a building where there are other humans performing these tasks is invaluable. Being able to just listen in on other people's phone calls and see how they handle things. It is huge. Being at home in your little home office straight away from brand new is really tough to mm-hmm. like get all of that learning by like absor- like osmosis, right? right? Like they're nearby me doing real estate and I can be like, hey, I heard you talking about staging on that call. Like, how did you know? Blah, blah, blah. Like it's easier to get a quick answer to a question if the people in your office are used to seeing you in the office and and you're there and you can see them and quickly pass by and be like, or they can tell you something. They're like, hey, you know, you need to know this or whatever. What is that saying about like 
You're um, you're the average of the five people you spend time with, yeah, the most time with. I don't um, know, like, what, but like the universe gives you. Oh yeah, what you fo- focus on grows. What you focus on grows. Like if you're just even when you have nothing going on, if you are in the office, yeah, you will find something. Do you have phone duty? Right. I mean, I am still a huge advocate for. It at least gets you to the office. Maybe the phone rings. Maybe it doesn't. Right. But you are bringing something to do while you're there. Well, handwriting letters, working on your database. Just simply sitting in a real estate mindset for eight hours or four hours of a day, multiple times a week, is a game changer. Yeah. Just being there. What The other one is the harder I work, the luckier I get. Yeah. Like I just happened to be in the office and my broker needed to assign a lead and was like, oh, Alyssa's here. Right. Here you go. Oh, I can promise you we did not have – Um, I don't know. Maybe when I first got there, there was some floor duty or like someone could be on the phones. But over time, it kind of went away at my REMAX office. But for – Sure, 1000% just being present on a regular basis did get a errant like, hey, someone wandered into the office. Hey, somebody just called and needs to get an answer to this question right mm-hmm. now. Like, yes, did I get leads from just being present? Yes, I did. For sure. Mm-hmm. For sure. And in my brokerage before that, the little boutique one where there was only five agents and I mirrored, I mean, I shadowed my broker who was working, who was selling everywhere she went, showing, I showed up every morning at 9 a.m. and I was dressed and ready for work and I sat there all day long and if she had appointments, I got in the car with her and I went. Um, I still attend our Monday morning meeting, which used to be the new agent meeting and now, but you know, 12 years later, here I am. And now there's a lot of like seasoned agents that attend too, but I get texts two or three times a month from other seasoned agents in my office saying, hey, I don't really know a lot of the new agents. Do you know which one would be a good one for me to refer something to? Right. I get it all the time. And I immediately am like, this one, she's always there, or this one is really working and hustling. Like, you, w- but if people never see you and they don't see that you're putting in the effort, they don't think you want to work. Right. That's the problem with being in a career that is so many people doing it part time, and then there's the section of people doing it full time. The a lot of agents who maybe are busy and need that help don't assume that every person with a license at their office wants to work. Right. You have to do behaviors that make other agents see you and say, that person wants to work. Mm-hmm. That They're in the office. They're here. They're at the meetings. They're asking questions. They're just present. They want to – They real estate is a focus for them. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I think the, one of the last notes I had about things to consider, especially if you're brand new, mm-hmm. I – didn't have numbers for myself. Right. So I couldn't say, oh, well, let me show you what I have done. But we had broker reports that we could make that showed how we perform in certain zip codes as a company. And so my first few years, I was really trained to say, my company does X, Y, and Z. The marketing plan of my company is this. Every Wednesday, my company has sales meetings where we talk about upcoming listings. Like these are our numbers from last year. So I was really able to get good at speaking confidently on behalf of the company. Yeah. And then as I got my own numbers, I kind of like had a hybrid. And now I can just do, you know, share whatever numbers I need to share. But it was very helpful when nobody knew who Alyssa Jenkins was, yeah. at least they knew who my company was. Right. And you, Alyssa Jenkins had no numbers. No numbers. So she needed something for a little bit. So I think looking at the reputation of the company yeah. that you choose as a brand new agent is more important. Sure. Because you don't have a lot backing you personally. So you need a strong name behind right. you. And that doesn't mean you need a giant franchise name. It just no. means you need a company who's working and it actually has some sales. Stats. Well, that's a good point because, you know, if you're, especially if you're not licensed yet, you don't have access to MLS yet. No. Maybe you could ask the broker or an agent in the office to show you where that brokerage stands in MLS. Right. You can actually look at Mm -hmm. production numbers of how an office is doing. You can check those things. Right. You could just, in your broker interview, ask for some stats on the broker. Right. Yeah, I think that's probably a good idea, mm-hmm. especially no matter what size broker you're interviewing, right? right? 
Okay. I also made a note that if I was maybe like relocating or going to a new market and I had five or more years of experience, this interview would go down differently, right? Mm -hmm. You'll already kind of know what you need or what you expect or what you didn't like at your last broker. But I think I would also maybe pick a broker more focused on working in the manner that I like to work. So if it's a high social media focus, then great. If Mm -hmm. it's a, you know, like my current broker is design and staging focus. Well, that speaks to me as a person and how I want to serve my clients. Well, I wouldn't go to a broker that's number one strategy was door knocking. Right. Not your thing. Like, I don't want to do that. So I'm not going to be interested in what you're teaching me. Like, Mm -hmm. I want to go somewhere that feels good Mm -hmm. and and matches with how I want to work. I love that. Kind of like your personal brand of how you conduct your business. Does it align? Yes, for sure. And if you're new and figuring that out, just, you know. Yeah. Look, you can always change. Mm -hmm. It is uncomfortable. It is not fun. So I would make the decision thoughtfully the first time. But you can change. It's okay. And you might need to change further in your career, even if you loved your broker for however long. Like, I love my broker. I don't have any complaints about when I was with Remax. I was there for 14 years. Am I unhappy that I changed? No, I like where I'm at now. Like, I can like them both. You're in a totally different different, season of life. It's a different, totally different place. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions from the list? I thought that was pretty good about covering everything. I mean, really, it's not overall a super long or arduous interview. No. It's pretty simple. What do you offer? What does it cost? Who's here? How often are we together? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are you going to teach me? And then outside of that interview, just making sure that you are maybe meeting a few people in the office and taking a tour of the office. I mean, it'd be nice to have a friend there, but yeah. Even the first office I went to, I didn't know anyone. I knew not anyone. I didn't know anyone at either of the ones I interviewed with, Mm -hmm. you know? So. Right. You'll, look, you'll make a friend. Yeah. If you're there. Now they're like my best friends. Right. You're like, I'm so (laughs) glad I'm here. Okay. Are you ready for a toast? Yeah. Any other parting words on choosing a broker? I know you love yours so much. I do. What will happen when Connie retires? She's not. She's just going to stay yeah, forever. She is. Yeah. You've told her she has to stay. Mm-hmm. And she's told me she's staying forever. Oh, great. Do you think you could potentially retire before Connie? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Okay. <laughs> and moving on. All right. So our toast today comes from Leah Sloan. Leah Sloan to Mandy Street. Oh, I wish Mandy. I had, uh, Mandy, I wish I had a last name like Street. I know. You know, like locally we have an agent whose last name is House. How convenient. Cannot handle it. And her tagline is, house knows homes. She does. Okay, so Mandy, I would love to know what your street tagline is. Right. Anyway, we're moving. Let me help you find your street. Yeah. Street, find your street. (laughs) That needs work. Right, yeah. (laughs) All right, so Leah would like to say to Mandy that she has been a mentor not only in real estate, but in life. She is a rock star. So appreciate her knowledge and wisdom. Thankful that she introduced me to the Hustle Humbly community. Oh. Thank you, Mandy. And yeah. cheers to you. And thank you to Leah. Thank you for submitting a toast. Um, you guys, remember, you can always submit a toast to us via the website, mm-hmm. hustlehumblypodcast.com. And there is like a little contact form. Great. Great. Okay. Y'all have a nice day. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Hustle Humbly Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please go to ratethispodcast.com slash hustle humbly and leave us a review or like this video. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell for notifications. If you have an episode topic or someone you'd like to toast on the show, please email us at team at hustle humbly podcast.com. Find us on social media at hustle humbly podcast. Don't forget to find all the free resources at hustle humbly podcast.com slash resources. See you next week. <laughs>